Okay, good morning everyone. Thank you for coming to this talk. My name is Adam Furmanek and today we're going to talk about internals of async. And before we actually begin, a few words of warning. Uh, the title of this talk is internals, meaning that I generally assume you do know how to use async and await more or less. You do know there is a synchronization context and you know there is some state machine generated by the compiler. So I won't be covering all those basics. I'll try to take you into the internals of this mechanism. What we are going to see during this next 15 minutes is how those things are connected under the hood. How TPL is implemented, what is task exactly, what is await. We will see the state machine and how synchronization context ties and glues all those things together. So our goal for this talk is there are actually two things. First, we would like to understand this very counterintuitive fact which you can see currently at the slide that Entirely during the async and await execution, there is no thread dedicated to waiting for the task. Not at all. And we are going to see how it's possible that even though we don't have any thread, we are still able to do some work and achieve what we want to do. And second thing is we'll understand all the internals, all the things going under the hood to finally implement mechanism which we'll use to await async void methods. So we'll see how those things work under the hood and then we'll re-implement part of the .NET to await async void. Before we begin, a few words about me. Uh, my name is Adam. I was a .NET developer for over five years, mostly here in Krakow. And now I'm a Scala Big Data Machine Learning guy at Amazon in Seattle in US. I'm also a blogger and public speaker. Recently, I released this book called .NET Internals Cookbook, in which I explain a lot of internals of .NET platform in a form of like a series of questions and answers. So if you are interested in how this works under the hood, feel free to take a look at this book and... Uh, and uh, Enjoy. Uh, also, I'm a blogger. My blog is blog Adam Furmanek PL. Feel free to take a look and uh, drop me a line if you find something interesting. If you would like to ask me any questions offline after this talk, uh, then drop me a line either via email or on Twitter. Let's go. What we are going to do today is we typically think about async and await in terms of tasks. So we'll see some details of the task implementation under the hood. And then we'll move on to synchronization context internals. What that is, how it works, what are the implementations, and how those things are connected, how they interact with each other. Finally, we'll examine the state machine generated by the compiler, and not only the part generated when we build the project, but also what things from TPL library are used by the state machine to it provide this mechanism called async and await. And ultimately, when we know all those details, we'll go through some typical deadlock scenarios, through typical exception problems, and ultimately we'll await async uh, void methods. Let's begin. So, the first thing which we're actually gonna start with is the very counterintuitive understanding of async and await. Typically, we think about async and await in terms of, of tasks. However, the truth is async and await does not need task at all. What we can do is we can actually await anything which provides this method called getAwaiter. So in this example, what I'm doing here in this code is I am actually awaiting integer. So you can see here that there is await2000. And what this thing does is because I provided an extension method returning this awaiter, I can await anything. This is called duct typing. And the same mechanism is used under the hood, for instance, with for each loops. You don't need to implement any interface to implement to support for each loops in .NET. What you need to do is you need to provide a method called getEnumerator. So the same goes for async and await. And what we do here is actually we are never awaiting a task. What we are actually awaiting under the hood is the so-called awaiter. And as we'll see during this talk, there are actually multiple implementations of awaiters. And we'll see how they are connected together. So I'm not saying that this code is probably something you should start doing right away in your code base. All I'm trying to show you is, hey, you don't need task to await things. So let's continue. So the duck typing uh, actually requires something returning a waiter which supports some methods like is completed or incompleted or get result. And async means nothing. Async is just a keyword provided by the or used by the compiler to, to recreate the methods which we mark with this modifier so that the compiler knows where, where to introduce the code, returning the awaiters, storing them, and using them under the hood. And as we can see, we can provide 
provide the ability to await anything, not only by implementing some interfaces or by modifying the types, but also by using extension methods. So generally, we can await anything as long as we conform to the, to the expected interface of getAwaiter. But typically what we do is we just await tasks. So let's actually see what tasks are in .NET Platform and how they work under the hood. So it's worth understanding that tasks were introduced before async and await started, before async and await appeared. And in TPL, in Task Parallel Library, what we were using was so-called de delegate task or CPU bound task. Currently, this task class represents two completely different use cases. One of them is the CPU bound, which represents some work, some actual job to be done. We need to run something, we need to calculate something, we need to do something. This is represented by a task which is CPU bound and this is what is typically used in TPL with task factory, with peeling and with all those other things. However, the task we use with async await, even though it's exactly the same class, it represents completely different meaning, completely different use case, which is basically a promise, basically an, a thing representing the soon to be available results, something which will be there, which we promise one day it will appear, but we don't necessarily need to calculate it. This can be, for instance, just waiting for something. And the important thing here is this thing does not need to run anything. This thing is just there. It just represents that the result will be there at some point, but we don't need to calculate it in any way. However, because it's still represented by the same task class, we need to actually understand how this task is being used under the hood. And if we start dissecting the class, we can see that there are three important like phases of or like stages of life of the task. First stage is like creation of the task. At some point we need to create it, we need to somehow construct it, so it can be used later. Then we are used to using the task with continue with methods, so we join multiple, multiple methods with continue with, add more lambdas to run, and ultimately when the task finally finishes what it's supposed to be doing, then we need to clean up the task. So let's go through all of those uh, phases and see what's happening under the hood. So when it comes to task creation, the important thing here is we typically create tasks using either task run or task factory start new or somewhat implicitly by using peeling or any other mechanism. However, you can actually create tasks using constructor. And this was a very explicit use case of task, which was one of the goals when TPO was created. However, the thing is you should never be using that. The definition of like the difference between the task created using constructor or task created task run is that the task created by constructor is not yet scheduled, will not start working at all. It needs to be scheduled manually to kick it off to start calculating the job and this is what task run does under the hood. So why would we ever create a task without starting it? And the thing is, before we had task, we had many other patterns for async programming, like event asynchronous pattern or whatever else. And all those were based basically on callbacks. The problem with callbacks was that it was a callback hell. We didn't know what the flow is, etc., etc. So we wanted to capture the code to execute with some strong type. And this is how we actually represent the code. So this is how we create just a task representing something, but we don't necessarily run it. We don't care whether it's run or not, because this is something which will be done by task scheduler. So the, what we should take from this slide is is don't create task using constructor, always create it using task run. However, remember that when task is created, what is happening under the hood, there is a task scheduler used. So if we actually dissect the implementation and see what's happening there, we can actually see that there is a method called schedule and start, which ultimately under the hood goes to task scheduler and calls internal queue task. And now the question is, what is a task scheduler? And obviously there is one provided by .NET and it's pretty like clever, pretty convenient. It supports like different types of queues, different types of tasks. It supports long running tasks, short running, work stealing, all those things. However, the thing is this task scheduler is just given for us by .NET and is used by default. 
But if we ever have a need, we can always replace this task scheduler with our, like, our different custom implementation. And when it comes to how to implement task scheduler, this is something like this. What we need to do to implement the task scheduler is basically a collection of tasks which, which we just get and try executing them. That's all. I don't expect you to remember this code or to, uh, to learn what is happening here. What I want you to remember is we know how to implement a task scheduler and we'll use it later during this talk. Okay, so we created a task. We, it was already started either using uh, task run or manually by submitting it to task scheduler. What is happening now is task is doing some job. We probably want to join this job or continue it with some other lambdas. And what we can do is to use the continue with method, which basically applies another continuation to the task. So when the current job being executed finishes, the continuation starts executing. This continue with method is super powerful. It supports a lot of different options like run continuation only when there was an exception, only where everything succeeded, only where there's was like any other uh, like uh, options. It can attach the task to parent or not, so we can create basically a tree of tasks. Generally, a lot of things. One important thing here is hide scheduler. What we can do here is when attaching continuation, we can hide the task scheduler, which we have seen on the previous slide. So how does the continue with work under the hood? And when we start like dissecting the code and picking in the TPL internals, what we can see is first we create the standard task continuation. The task continuation which represents the job to be done, and ultimately this task continuation is basically passed here to task at task continuation. So what is this task continuation? How does it work? Generally, the task is executing something or waiting for something or representing some job to do. And at some point, there is a complete method which is being called either by library or by driver or by whatever else. And this complete method calls try set result to set the result of the executed task and carry on. If we continue debugging those things, this try set result uses some state machine under the hood and goes to finish stage three. And ultimately, we end up in a method called finish continuations. And this finish continuations basically goes to our task continuation and calls run method. So how this works under the hood is our task represents something. And this is the place where we actually see that there is ne not necessarily any thread waiting for the task to finish. Because there, something needs to just call this method. And then when this complete method is being called, we continue with continuations to carry on and execute other things. So this is how continue with works. And what standard task continuation run does is basically it does exactly the same thing which we have already seen with our task run implementation. It uses the task and calls schedule and start. And at this point, we basically end up in the task scheduler and continue executing the job. So this is how we finish this loop. We start the task by submitting it to the task scheduler, then something calls the complete on the task, and then complete under the hood calls continuation, which in turn again calls the schedule and start and goes through task scheduler, obviously assuming we did not override it and changed any of the internals. So this is how continue with works. So we generally know how to create a task. We know how to carry on, apply more and more lambdas. Now the question is how to clean up the task. And the thing is, we should never do that. There's, there are actually two reasons for never disposing a task. First thing is, in theory, task may allocate something which should be cleaned up. It implements idisposable, we should clean it up. However, in .NET 4, whenever you dispose a task, it basically kills it. You cannot use continue with anymore. So if you dispose the task, it's done. The task is not usable anymore at all. If you do this in .NET 4.5, however, the things under the hood are generally not allocated, so there is nothing to clean up. So the takeaway from this slide is in .NET 4, don't dispose because you are going to break the task. In .NET 4.5, don't dispose because there is nothing to dispose. And one more thing about tasks is that task is a class. 
it's heap allocated, so then it needs to be garbage collected, then it needs to be cleaned up. And because of that, there, was, there is a thing called value task, which is a structure, which is allocated on a stack and does not need to go through the GC. The thing is, what I recommend reading here is Joe Duffy, who was implementing all those things for tasks, actually was working on an operating system called Midori, in which everything was async and await, everything, and tasks over there were purely struct and like stack based. So he once said that it's like it was his biggest mistake to implement the task using classes, but now we can actually continue with value tasks that are back in .NET Core. So we can use them to decrease the allocation. If we want to decrease the allocation even more, take a look at this put value task source by Konrad Kokosa, where he explains how to cut the allocations even down. Okay. That was, well, that was all when it comes to tasks. So now we understand how tasks work under the hood. And now comes the other important part, which is actually more important than tasks when it comes to async and await. And it's called synchronization context. Generally, we always had a need to execute some code, always. It was generally that we always had some asynchronous calculations which we then wanted to use to update the UI. So always we had some notion of, hey, take this code, run it somewhere else. Not necessarily on other thread, not necessarily in like separate thread pool or whatever else. Generally take it and execute it. And there is a thing called asynchronize invoke, which was like commonly used before the async away, the nice synchronization context and all those things. However, the problem with asynchronize invoke was that it was thread based. So we always knew that this asynchronize invoke is tied to a given thread. So whenever we try submitting something or posting something to it, it needs to do the context switch and all those things. But that was not what we wanted to do. What we wanted to achieve was always, hey, take this code, run it. Somewhere, somehow, sometime, we don't necessarily care, but this code must be executed. And this is how synchronization context emerged, and actually this is how execution context was implemented. With all the code we execute, there is not only like the code itself to be run, there are a lot of other things. There's like security, permissions, impersonation information, there is like thread local, there is async local, a lot of, the, of other different things which need to be basically carried on with the task as it's being executed. So execution context is basically a bug for all those things. It holds all those metadata to be executed or to support the execution. And one of those implementations used by execution context is synchronization context. And the synchronization context is just a base notion of the semantic that, hey, I do have some code, I want to execute it somewhere, please do it for me. I don't care whether it's other thread, whether it's other thread pool, whether it's the same thread, whether it's synchronous or not, I don't care, just get this code, execute it for me. And synchronization context does not specify whether it will be run synchronously, asynchronously, whether it will be implemented on any other threads. And the thing here is, here comes probably the most important sentence of this talk is, when awaiting the awaitable type, the current synchronization context is captured. This means that whatever synchronization context we use at the point of awaiting something, it will be captured and used later. As we will see during this talk, there are completely different or various implementations of synchronization context. And you can see if we like take a look at this, depending on the type of application you execute, synchronization contexts work completely differently. For UI applications like WinForms, WinRT, or WPF, the synchronization context must be tied to the UI thread because there is only one thread which can modify the UI, which can modify the state of our application like the visual state. So everything which we post through the synchronization context must go through that one single thread. However, when it comes to something like ASP.NET applications, we don't necessarily care about the thread. What we do care about instead is the HTTP request or the network request we are currently processing. So anything going through synchronization context in ASP.NET will be basically run in terms or in the context of this one single HTTP request or network request which is being processed. It does not need to be the same thread. In fact, we can switch threads on the go as we process the request. However, it will always be the same metadata of the request. If we have no synchronization context at all, like in console applications, 
the one the logic used under the hood is thread pool based so we use the default.net thread pool to submit the tasks and to execute the code and now the thing is depending on the synchronization context behavior of async and await will be completely different so we need to understand which synchronization context we have in our application and what's worse is we can change synchronization context while running the application so let's see how the synchronization context and tasks are tied together and to do that we'll actually examine the code generated by the compiler so before we start we want to start with like very simple methods. First one is main, which is not very important to this discussion. We basically call our async method and wait for it. And what we have here is four important parts. We have one await here, another await here, another here, and then at the very end, we don't have any more awaits. We just throw the exception. So what we are awaiting is first we await task from result, which as we know, should never block us. Then we await task delay, which should effectively always block us for like 200 milliseconds in this example. And then we are awaiting task yield, which is basically doing the something like context switch uh, in order to, uh, to continue execution. So if we start compiling this method, you can see that we do have this async modifier here. When we compile this thing, what we get is basically, this is a screenshot of the code generated. And as you can see, it's something like 130 lines. So let's go through this generated code and understand exactly what is happening under the hood. So first thing to note here is there is no async anymore. After we compile this and start decompiling, there is no async anymore in this method because everything was regenerated and now is completely synchronous. What is happening here is we do create the, some async, uh, some type supporting the async code, which is like program our async method, the underscore underscore one. So this is some internal thing generated by the compiler. It has few fields, which we'll see in a moment. What is one important thing here is we initiate the state to integer minus one we return the task from this thingy and also one more thing we do here is we call the start method on this type so let's see what is happening here when we take a look at the fields of the class generated we can see the state field which we have already seen there is another field for builder which supports the, the execution or the compiler thingies but we can also see there are three task awaiters we already know we don't need to await anything like task what we await actually in dotnet or in c sharp is an awaiter and we have three different fields for awaiters because we had those four parts uh, in our method, we had three awaits things, so there are three different awaiters for each line we execute. First of them is task awaiter of boolean for task from result. The other one is task awaiter for task delay. And the final one is yield await table yield awaiter, which is nowhere close to anything like task related. And this is for task yield. So we do have to those awaiters. And now let's see what is happening. We like noted that we call the start method and what the start method does, it calls the state machine dot move next. And this is where the whole async await magic happens. So let's see the move next under the hood. So when we continue the compiling the code, the move next in general has this very generic structure, which is basically we take the current state, which we initialized initially for minus one. Then we do the try and catch. In catch, we handle all the exceptions. We change the state to minus two to indicate that, hey, something failed. And we also set this exception on the task object. What is important here to note immediately is whenever you have async method, your exceptions will be automatically handled, handled in this exception block. So they will not be propagated just like that automatically. In order to propagate them, we need to actually do some work. So let's now carry on and see what is happening in this try block inside it. So we had four logical parts of our method. We had this task from, task from result, task delay, task yield, and just throwing exception. So if we take a look like generally on this method, what is happening is we do have some big switch statement at the top, which is then divided or split into like three logical, logical blocks. So blocks for first part of the method, second, third, and first part again. And then after switch, we do have some labels which we'll, we'll be using go to to jump to those. And we have another two, three, and four other parts. So let's start executing this method conceptually and see what is happening under the hood. 
So first thing is before we call await task from result, what we do is we enter the switch with our state is equal to minus one. And in this thingy, what we do is because we don't have case for minus one, we just continue with default. So we just print out what we were printing out before, and then we call get awaiter and check if it's completed. Because the code we were executing was task from result, obviously this awaiter must be completed because that's the whole point of task from result. So what we do here is we do not enter this uh, this if at all, we just call break, and we then ultimately call awaited get result because task from result returns our result immediately, we just carry on. Think here is, we did have a wait, but we never stopped executing the method. We are still executing it completely synchronously. We did not do any thread switch. We did not go through any thread pool or task scheduler. We just executed this code in the place where we just started executing the method. So let's carry on. Now is the part two before task delay. So we start here around line 72 because this is where we ended the previous part. What we do here is we do console right line and then we get the awaiter for task delay. So what is happening now is we check the awaiter for task delay and we can obviously see that, hey, task delay hasn't finished. It's not yet completed because that's the point of task delay. So what we do here is we do some bookkeeping, we enter the if switch, uh, the if construct basically, we do some bookkeeping to change the state to one, then we call await and save uncompleted, which we'll see in a second, but important thing here is we just do return. And then we go back to the code which we have already seen, and when we were calling the start method, the next line was we were returning a task. So we basically return a task here and stop the execution. There is no sleeping, no waiting, no locking, we just return a task. So let's see what is happening in this await and save uncompleted, because first it seems to be unsafe, and second, the whole magic must be happening there. So when we start debugging this or decompiling this thing, first thing is we do some, we create some action called completion action where we call the method get completion action and then this action is injected into the awaiter. We call awaiter unsafe uncompleted with this action. So let's see what it means, this get completion action. What it does is it goes through new async method builder core and gets the move next runner. If you recall, the way we started executing our async method was by calling method move next. So this is probably something similar to it. So we generate this thingy, and this move next runner, what, is ba what it basically does, it creates some callback, and then ultimately, it just calls move next in this part. So this is some kind of sophisticated lambda represented by multiple types, which ultimately goes under the hood and calls move next on, the, on our uh, type supporting state machines. So what this await and save on completed also does when it creates this action, it needs to pass it to, to as a continuation to the awaiter. And what is happening next, we call task set continuation for await and we pass this continuation. And this part we have already seen because in the task we had this complete method which was called either by the driver or by TPL or by any other library which was effectively going through all the continuations and executing them one by one. So this is the part which we already know and what this part does, this set continuation for await, is it does this the most important thingy. It checks whether we do have a synchronization context, and if we do, we capture that synchronization context. We then add this continuation, and when we see the, the running the callback, how this continuation goes, it just runs the callback, and ultimately we end up in this continuation, so we had to go through a lot of different like types under the hood to end up in this place. And in this place, we get this captured synchronization context, and what we do is we post the method so it goes through the synchronization context. And now the thing is, depending on the synchronization context which we have, we either go to the UI thread, or we go to the same HTTP request, or we go to the thread pool, or to any other implementation. So here is the other loop which we finally complete. First loop was, there is a task, on complete, call continuations, we are done. The other loop is, hey, there is a continuation, go through synchronization context, synchronization context knows how to go through the thread pool or whatever else, and starts executing or continues executing the code. 
If we carry on, what is happening next is we have a third part, which was just before await task yield. And in this third part, we again start around like here, because this is where we left off the previous part. So we call a console right line third part. We again call get awaiter. It's not completed because this is the point of task yield. Again, we call await and save on completed, all those things. And ultimately, when we come back to the method, we enter again the switch, and because we change the state to something different, we go through this switch, and we again go to through go to line and execute the fin final instruction, which is like around here, and this is how we call the get result. So this is how async method works under the hood. Whenever it needs to stop, because a waiter tells it, hey, stop, because I'm not done yet, we just create a lot of machinery under the hood to create this move next runner, and this move next runner at some point is basically calling the move next method again. And because we captured the state or we persisted the state by modifying the field just like in here to set the state to some different integer value, we enter this method again and we go through the switch again, but this time we do have matching switch for some different state. So we execute the same method only sh like closer to its beginning. Uh, and we execute some different code. So we continue here, and because at this point, because move next was executed again, we assume awaiter was completed, so we just get this awaiter, and we can do the jump and get the result, which should be already there. So this is how async and await works under the hood. So the last part we just need to cover in this method is basically the part after last await, which what it does is, is just throwing the new exception. And we already said that this new exception is being handled here immediately, so we don't need to do anything with this. So this is how state machine, synchronization context, and task connect together to support the very simple, simple or at least seemingly simple mechanism called async and await. And now let's see how easy it is to generate a deadlock with this mechanism. So even though there is no threat, we still need to do some magic to execute the code. And we can do deadlock if we have just one threat. The important part is never ever wait synchronously for tasks. Use async all the way up, or you may easily run into problems, which we will see now. So let's go through this uh, conceptual code showing what is happening with this capturing the synchronization context. So we do execute, oops, we do execute the some handler for download button. And what we are doing here is we do the await process data async, so at this point we capture the synchronization context, but we already know we start executing the method. So we enter this method, what we are doing here is we call await download async and we call configure await false. This method tells the awaiters to not capture the synchronization context, to continue without it as there was none. So what is happening here, this line is being executed on the UI thread still. But the continuation, basically this part here, this is the continuation of our await in this line, is executed via the synchronization context, which was not captured, so it goes through the thread pool. And the difference here, or the thing worth noting here, is if this download async finishes synchronously, we do not go through the thread pool at all. We continue executing the method synchronously, so this continuation can be run either on the UI thread or using the thread pool because there was no synchronization context. Again, we call await transform async, and we call configure await, etc. And this continuation here, or from here to this part, is basically again executed via the thread pool, but this just calling or like finishing the method. So we go back to the, our click handler, and now we come to this continuation. And because here we did capture the synchronization context, this thing goes through the UI thread always. No matter whether we switch to thread pool or not, this must go through the UI thread because this is what we wanted it to do. So, with this code in mind, we can actually see how to create a deadlock. So let's do something simple. 
We just call a sy like operation on context. We just call await task delay and does some printing, and we call wait on it. Synchronous blocking dot wait. What is happening here is when this thing finishes and we do want to execute the continuation, this continuation needs to go through the captured synchronization context. This is a console application. There is no synchronization context at all. We go through the thread pool because our original thread was blocked. We need to use some other thread from the thread pool so we can finish this method, we can continue. This method does not block the, does not deadlock. This succeeds because there is no, there are more threads available than we need to. However, if we take exactly the same code and execute it in win forms or any other UI framework of your choice, what we are doing here is we again call away, call away task delay and then this continuation needs to go through the synchronization context. So what it tries to do is it goes through the context and goes to the UI thread, but our UI thread is blocked here. So our UI thread is blocked completely and will never have a chance to execute the continuation. So in this example, we basically have a deadlock. Simple as that. Even though we did not change the code, it's exactly the same code. We just changed the synchronization context under the hood, and now we have we run into troubles. How to solve this? There is a very simple thing in this example. Just call configure await. What is happening here? The continuation, which would be here, would be called on the synchronization context, since we did not capture it, we go through the thread pool. Thread pool has some more threads, we finish the completion, uh, the continuation, and what happens next is this dot wait has a chance to finish. So even though the UI was like blocked or frozen for a second, we don't have a de indefinite deadlock, like never finishing. Okay, but what happens if someone tries doing something like this? We did not capture the synchronization context, and now we call invoke to run something on the UI thread. Again, we, had, we have exactly the same issue because our UI thread is stuck in the synchronous dot wait. So here, even though continuation has another thread to execute, but the continuation wants to go to the UI thread and the UI thread is blocked, deadlock again. How to solve it? And this is something probably you should never use in production. But if you ever run into situations like this, there is generally a nice trick how to do it. Basically, we cannot block the UI thread. How the continuation on UI thread works is go it goes through the message loop, so it posts a message between threads, and what we need to do is we need to basically call application do events to run all those messages from the loop, from the message pump. So because we are just slipping here for one millisecond, at some point the continuation comes as a message, we execute it on the UI thread, and then we can continue. We should not be doing gen generally doing that, but if you ever start calling dot wait synchronously, then probably this is the smallest hack you need to do in your applications. Let's carry on. What happens with unit tests? I know we never create win forms in unit tests, but let's say someone did that. So what is happening here is we just call new form. So we create some like win forms form, and then we call await. And what happens? This thing never finishes. Why is that? Because new form, when it goes through the constructors of WinForms framework, it replaces the synchronization context. I mentioned that you can change the synchronization context on the go, and this is what this thing does. It replaces the synchronization context to use the WinForms one. So because an unit uses completely different synchronization context, it does not notice that, hey, this await was finished and the method succeeded. What we can do? Well, generally we should not be creating things like this in unit tests, but if we ever need to, we can capture the old synchronization context, create new form, and replace the synchronization context on our thread. What I'm showing you here is synchronization context is basically a global variable, which can be replaced by anything or any code you run. So beware when you are doing this. One so those were deadlocks, the typical scenarios for deadlocks. What happens next is exception handling. When it comes to handling exceptions, there are actually two differences between void methods and tasks methods. So in void methods, or actually in task method, let's start with this one, as we have seen, exceptions are captured immediately and they are not propagated until we finally awaited the task. In void methods, they are propagated in so-called out-of-band manner. So let's actually see this in action. So let's run this very simple example here, uh, which is exception in async. Mm -hmm. So what we are doing here is 
We are just running a very simple method. Please ignore that it crashed, it's as designed. So we do have a method throw, which is async void. And what is happening here is we wait for 300 milliseconds, then throw an exception. What is going on here is we call this method throw twice, and we do the catch handler. And then we carry on, we do after sleep, we wait, and we print something else. What we can see with this output is that when we executed this method first, it crashed, but second, it printed out this after sleep and done. So even though the exception was propagated, the application continued and executed the lines. But what happens if we introduce the sleep for 600 milliseconds here, which in theory should be long enough to capture the exception if it was like propagated on this thread. So let's run this application, it crashes again, but what you can see here is just by introducing some artificial sleep or delay under the hood, we don't have this done printed out anymore. So depending on how you sleep or how you slow down the application which you are executing, different things can happen. But what happens if instead of doing async void, we do async task? So as we have already seen when we are dissecting the state machine, async task method captures the exceptions and you can see that this time the application succeeds but there is no exception at all. It was completely lost. So now the question is, can we get this exception somehow? And here comes another demo for this. And the other demo is basically, there is so a thing called unobserved task exception. So whenever you have a task which was never, uh, which had an exception, but this exception was never like retrieved by the caller, the task was never awaited, what is happening is when the task is being cleaned up by the garbage collector, it calls the exception, gets it, and calls the handler for unobserved task exception. So what you can see here is, I am calling the test method which just froze, and then what I'm doing is I am doing the console read line. So this application is waiting here in read line, no exception at all, even though the test method finished like long time ago. But as soon as I press enter here, we can actually see that unobserved task exception was executed and we can extract this exception. So if you don't await your tasks, you may lose the exception, but you can retrieve it somehow using these handlers. Okay, let's continue with awaiting async void. So what we have seen is how task works under the hood, what synchronization context is, what the task scheduler was, what the state machine was. Now the question is, how can we await async void method? And in order to do that, what we basically need to do is just replace few things which are provided for us by .NET and use them differently. So first thing we are going to implement is the task scheduler. The thing I told you to remember that we can implement task scheduler. What is important here is we basically have this public collection of tasks in this task scheduler. Then we do have synchronization context which uses this task scheduler and also creates the task factory in which we hide the default scheduler and also we provide our custom scheduler to be used inside this code when creating the tasks. What happens next is whenever we post something through this synchronization context, we go through our factory and we create new tasks using our custom code. We can also count the tasks because we have two callbacks, operation started and operation completed. And what is happening next is we do have this method like async void throw. Let's actually run this application so we will see that it's what it's doing. So it tries throwing something, then it waits, and then ultimately it prints the exception, but it does not crash. So what this throw method does, it sleeps again, and then throws the exception. How do we execute this method? We basically need to use our context to run this method via Lambda. And what we do in our context is we get the old synchronization context, replace it with current, with our custom one. Then we do create tasks and we continue through this task scheduler to get all the tasks available there. We consume them and execute them one by one. Whenever we hit the exception, we just, the exception is just being propagated just like that. And then finally, we restore the previous, except, the previous synchronization context. So what is happening next, we basically can run this. And the important thing from this method is we run this inside task run, so we do have some task doing the job. 
So we can just get this task, and now with this task we can do await, we can do whatever else. If we want to have the same exception semantics as it was with original await methods, we just call get await or get result, and then we can just capture the exception normally here, because it's propagated like synchronously, just as with any other normal task implementation. So we can see this application succeeded in printed out the details of exception, and also it did not crash at all. Okay, so having said all of that, short summary. First, know your synchronization context always, because depending on the implementation of synchronization context, you may have completely different deadlocks, different threading behavior, different scenarios for like multi-threading and all the things. Never ever wait synchronously for methods. Use async all the way up. The thing is, it's not always possible. First, there are other .NET languages which do not support, for instance, like callbacks returning tasks. So not all the .NET parts are easily, can be easily plugged with async await. So keep that in mind when you are using any asynchronous methods. Don't wait for synchro uh, synchronously for methods, this is already we mentioned. Always await the tasks, and if you don't, at least have the handler on the unobserved task exception. Because like anything can go wrong in your application, but if your logging does not work and does not log all the exceptions, then things will go much, much worse. And having said all of that, it's time for QA. This QR code points to my blog, which where you can download the slide deck. Also, this presentation I gave you today is just a part of much longer presentation. So the slide that you'll find there is the longer one with like more and more details. And now here is a QA time. So if you do have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Okay, uh, the question was, in previous versions of .NET, whenever we had some unobserved exception or generally out of bound exception, which we did not handle, this exception could take down the application and we couldn't prevent that, we couldn't stop that. The question is if it's this still the case. And the answer for the question is, you are right, the things has changed between .NET 1, .NET 2, and .NET 4. The thing is generally any unobserved exception on a thread will cure your application. You cannot prevent that. Even with this handler, you can log the exception, but not necessarily you can stop that. Those things do change between .NET Framework, .NET Core, so I don't actually know the definite answer if this stopped the application from crashing. Definitely unobserved exception on a thread queues the application, you cannot stop that, even if you go with like application domain and those handlers. Uh, so while I don't know the answer, you are very right. Those exceptions, if not handled correctly, may take down the application, and what's Worse, this differs whether you run the code like normally on a thread or whether you go through the thread pool or whether you go through task run or task factory start new, all those things. Those three different cases differ and in every single time the behavior may be completely different. I believe I do have a slide in this slide that comparing the differences for this if you are interested. Any other questions? Okay, the question was, I mentioned that uh, not all parts of .NET support async and await and we should do await all the way up. Now the question is what happens if we need to do some plumbing to actually support this await even though we are in a context like of legacy code or something else which does not support the thing. 
So uh, patterns, the answer is first, always do configure await false unless you explicitly want to capture the synchronization context. .NET Core goes even further. It like stopped using synchronization context for ASP applications at all. This is worth noting that when you migrate all the ASP application to ASP.NET Core, you are running outside of any synchronization context, so now you do have multi-threading. Previously, there was no multi-threading in the area of one, uh, of one HTTP request. So generally, always configure await false. Second, there are not like any other patterns I can recommend because it depends on the use case uh, and it depends how you want to wait for it. Generally, you always try to wrap this with task run. So even if there was like a deadlock scenario possible, you would be probably at least running it a bit on the thread pool. But as I have shown you with this invoke in WinForms, this does not solve all the issues. Generally, if you do need to wait for something not supporting async from asynchronous context, you are probably entering the land where you need to come up with clever hacks like this. Uh, unless you rewrite everything. Uh, so I cannot give you any other advice, unfortunately, for doing that. Any other questions? Yes. The question is, are there any other important changes between .NET Framework and .NET Core in this area async await? Generally, apart from removing synchronization context, there are no other changes. All those things work similarly, if not the same. Generally, nothing big to, to be mentioned. It all goes down to synchronization context, basically. Okay, if there are any other questions, I'll take them offline because we are running out of time. So just to wrap up, here you'll find some references if you are interested in the details of like multiple things around .NET, few books you may want to read. If you are interested in the things I just shown you today and the demos, you can find them on my blog. If you want to read about other async await things, synchronization context, threading, etc., but outside of my blog, there are a few more links you may uh, enjoy. And having said all of that, I think it's time to wrap up. So thank you for attending this talk. My name is Adam Furmanek, and I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.